this brain. Really ain't no difference if that nigga gay. Blood satellite. Uh, anyway, so that's just covering that. I guess we can cover one more thing that I thought you might find this interesting. And this kind of ties into what we were talking about with Geo a couple of nights ago. Uh, I don't know how I feel about this story, but I got a thought on it that might be giving it too much credit and being a bit too philosophically try hard. But here's the story is. Um, and this is reported by Vice on Motherboard. An AI-generated artwork won first place at a state fair fine arts competition, and artists are pissed. That's what they say. So basically, some uh, company um, is at the Colorado State Fair. Um, the artist was named Sin Carnet. The real name was a guy named Jason Allen, who's president of Colorado-based tabletop gaming company, incarnate games so he developed a program that made this art piece it's a nice piece it's kind of a like a futuristic regal aristocratic looking thing you can look it up right now um what would it be called i don't know what it's called it's called a theater theatre d'opera special so it's like space opera it's just a kind of vague you know, ballroom, big, you know, ostentatious looking stuff with kind of tech stuff thrown in. And I won first praise. And what he said, he I won first praise. I'm turning Japanese, turning Japanese. <laughs> um, but he printed out on canvas and made it look like someone really painted it. Um, and so it won. So um, artists are correctly pissed off, say, you know, you're what commoditizing you're you're making a mockery of art um some people would say no this is the people who are excited about tech will be saying this represents you know br the finally bridging the gap between ai and human consciousness if it can make art it passes some sort of visual touring test which we all love to do so um my thoughts on it were and i don't know i have I have this really you know hammered out yet but i was just thinking that like is is this almost a defense of modern art by which i mean if we can take these concepts of beauty that any fucking ai made by a guy almost as a joke can reproduce uh does that mean we need to evolve our concept of beauty because is it important in a sense to make artistic beauty something that only humans can produce and the fact that machines can produce it does that mean that our concept of beauty is unrefined or reductive or unevolved see what i'm saying yeah. like you could say oh here's just some like weird some random bullshit it's a space opera it's things that by the technical definition make a good art piece it's balanced it's got the rule of thirds it's got everything in there and so it's visually appealing and it appeals to something that we think is beautiful but really it's not like a space like aristocratic stuff in space yeah it doesn't really mean anything but it's something our scene loves we love that type of shit and my take was you know people will uh, scoff at modern art and as they should you know these new types of art that look lazy or they look just ugly on purpose but it made me think that do we need to def to discover a new type of beauty that is only achievable in the human context because the thing about modern art and a lot of this new stuff is it only works within the context of the artistic scene like people will joke that modern art stuff like weird sculptures are just a reaction to a reaction i'm like yes it's true but that means that it's, it's always locked within a human context viewed on its own it looks like trash and it looks stupid or it's like a sarcastic joke but within the context of art and the context of the people looking at it, it can be seen as beautiful. And it's only something that humans can appreciate as beautiful because it's within the human context. And this other thing we call visual aesthetics can be reproduced by something literally inhuman. Now, does this make any sense or am I just rambling? Yeah, no, no. Do you see I, what I'm saying? I, I agree. I would probably... So first of all, what you just laid down, I think is, is actually the core of the issue and you're correct. But I think the the direction you were going with it saying like maybe we need to lean further into the modern further into like the not abstract in terms of um as in terms of a category of of art but abstract in terms of something that's more connected but i don't i think that's the other the wrong direction to go the immediate problem i see with this you think about the context of this piece it's a flat 
It's a flat two dimensional image, color image on a canvas on a wall at a state fair. Step back. You're you're at the state fair, right? Step back. Look across the wall. The wall is white. There are other 2D flat images. And the beauty and the art of your environment, of your existence, ends there. Because you're all a bunch of fat, dumpy pieces of shit. You have a linoleum floor and a rusted roof. And you're driving some beater-ass car, which itself is a flat color painted with plastic. The The concept of, of art is like a subcategory of aesthetic beauty it's like a refined unit of aesthetic beauty in some sense but the aesthetic beauty used to be part of our entire world it was our clothes it was the layout of our streets and our shop fronts and our furniture and our architecture and the uh, song and dance and music were a normal part of our life that we par participated in music is another example of this we're now consumers of music we don't participate in it it's something atomized it's something uh, um inhuman almost so i think i think this is a wake up call to people that value art and beauty that if you leave art in this atomized context where it's some 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 mechanized unit that can be shared right but is not actually part of a personal community environment then it's open to be co-opted by ai or by by anybody it could co-opted by a foreign state or by your own state or by another party like I don't think you can't you can't like what you were saying about art and beauty and being something that's fundamentally about human interaction and, and perception and the way that people like the it's it's almost a spiritual thing, right? No, I think it, your, your, your thing makes a lot more sense. Yours like, is a lot more thought like if out. You, if you are if you're a person and you value beauty um, and this is a big issue for you, right? That you're angry about this AI artwork. Look at yourself in the mirror and ask yourself why you look the way you do. Why do you drive the car you drive? Why does your living room have the furniture arranged in the way that it is? And why did you have that furniture? Why do you have Ikea? Why do you, I mean, that's a, that's a, that's a thing with me, but like, uh, like why, uh, why do you have a bunch of used shit? Why do your clothes not match? Why do you listen to music, but you don't sing or play an instrument, right? So if you want to get away from this, the AI can't take any of that away from you. You did that for, to yourself. You took that away from yourself. You abandoned it for no reason other than I'm assuming convenience. So it, I, I think, and I'm not trying to, you know, spear people with this, but for anybody who values, really values art, but more importantly, beauty, you incorporate it into your life. So, and then I, like, like I said, an AI is not going to be able to take away your ability to dress yourself in a beautiful way or to arrange the furniture in your living room in a way that makes you feel like you're an environment full of beauty the iron the the relationship there is the only thing that the ai can do is provide a 2d painting which you may choose to hang on your wall in your living room but aside from that even that like there's only one of these copies at the state fair one person's going to buy it for 750 dollars, and they're going to go put it up in their living room and it's over right <laughs> that's the only actual real effect that that painting had what what's interesting is that I agree with everything you said completely because it also stays within the realm of investigating the context with which these things are viewed, and it makes you think that you know the idea of only looking at things as the standalone art is the is the actual problem as the separate thing, and it's interesting that if we follow that down to its logical extreme, that is how we get to the metaverse. So rather than really folk not focusing because you can't focus in every direction but really taking the time to to address the context with which these art pieces are viewed and improving the context at every single level like we we're just talking we actually dive deeper into the two-dimensional space and that's what the metaverse is yeah that yeah. is the, the the full 360 degree actualization of that problem of fakeness yeah yeah that we just decide to well let's just live inside that instead of taking and reworking the world around us like an ai generated painting on the wall at a state fair is like the inflect the inflection point and then full conversion over to the metaverse which is creative mode there's no limitations or restrictions on any on any technique or material but by the same token the relationships the actual relationships between the beauty and the art and the person and the people is completely fake it's all completely astroturfed that is the the other side of that fence 
And yeah, I mean, that's the direction we're heading. And so you can see it. This is a great example of, of where it's headed. Now, I'd like to take this and kind of segue it into the book that I read just recently. And it's a very, very good book. I like it a lot. I've heard it brought up in our scene quite a few times. Now, I don't know if I fully believe it. This is one of those books where it deals in concepts that reach back to prehistory. So there is no really good source for a lot of the claims. Look when we discussed Anthropomorphics by Dennis Bouvard, and we addressed this in our interview with him, where it's like, if you're talking about the true development of almost metaphysical ideas, like that happened before the written word, you know, there's no source for that. You can only kind of extrapolate how it must have been given what we know now. So this deals a lot with that, but it, cause really what we were just talking about deals with like what, what is human? What is the um, division between the human mind and the artificial mind? And we discussed this recently, a few months ago, when we did our our longer science arc. We talked about information theory. We talked about the Norbert Weiner book or Norbert Wiener book. I don't know which it is, but uh, cybernetics about how hu how AI actually thinks and how it's not entirely different than how a human mind thinks. But we know that there is a difference between the human mind and the artificial mind, even though the argument I made is that the human mind as it is, is mostly automatic and pre our brains pretty much behave the same way. However, there is a missing piece. There is something that does make us human and separates us from uh, machine learning. And we're trying to bridge that gap. And maybe we will bridge it one day. But uh, in this book, it's called... Uh, the Origin of Consciousness and in the Breakdown of the Bicameral Mind by Julian Jaynes. This is a psychology book. It was published by Mariner Books. It's a, uh, it's fairly recent too. Like this wasn't written that long ago. Um, it, it, I love this book because it, like all good books, it gives you another lens to put into the you know viewfinder or the telescope from which you can see the world. And it changed how I, I looked at things. And it makes a claim. And again, I'm not sure if it's 100% true, but he provides a series of sources and he's got some good evidence to show that something might have happened. And he shows enough stuff early on where I'm like, it can't all be wrong because he points to a lot of biological stuff. So the idea is like, what is consciousness? And how is consciousness changed over the millennia? Because he's talking, he's referencing like 8,000 BC. You know, he's talking about Cro-Magnon, man. He's talking about how this thing called consciousness grew within the, the human being, the human entity that separates us from animals. Because as he points out, um, and we pointed this out when we discussed information theory and communication, that, you know, what does separate man from animal? Because animals have language. They make sounds. They have groups and organizations. They have instincts and they they care for each other. They have communities. But there is something that separates us, even though they're a lot of, in, in many cases, mostly there. And he would say that it's consciousness. Now, what is consciousness? And there's a lot of disagreement. And he spends the first part of the book trying to describe what consciousness is not. And he comes to a definition of consciousness that I like a lot. And I, I'm going to use this going forward and with a little asterisk or a caveat at the end. But I'll start by saying, like, what is consciousness? He says, well, it's not just a property of matter. And it's not just an outgrowth of automatic functions because you're thinking, OK, well, you know, humans, we learn, we read, we talk. So consciousness is just kind of like a mutation of that. He's like, no, not really. He gives the example that uh, the, the concept of wetness cannot be derived from just oxygen and hydrogen. Right. We have this thing called water. But what is this thing called being wet? And that's a, a very like a philosophical idea. But that's just one example. So he says consciousness is also not just learning either because we can train machines to learn. And when we talked about the cybernetics example, like we can train unintelligent programs like plants learn. You've ever watched a plant grow? It learns how to grow based on its environment. It's really all learning is is memory plus feedback. So as long as you have a function in any system or any organism to take in feedback and remember it and kind of grow around it, that's how you get fucking trees that grow towards the water. So it's not right. just the idea of learning. It's not even thinking because, you know, we can we can actually learn without being conscious of learning. And he gives the example of consciousness. It, you can almost sabotage yourself with consciousness. You can kind of train yourself to learn. But once you think about thinking, 
you kind of fuck up. And if you've ever been giving a, like if you've ever been an athletes know this, like don't think just do go on your instincts when you're boxing, when you're running, when you're playing hockey, the moment you make yourself conscious is you kind of fuck yourself up and sabotage yourself. So a lot of your life is training yourself to behave without consciousness. And we, when we talked about that book on killing about how we train people to kill, we're actually just trying to drill into them automatic functions to perform X tasks. So it's not even about learning. It's not about doing any of that. It's not just for recording memories either, because consciousness and memories are different functions in the brain. Where could all this interior world that we have walk around the world with and make decisions with and so on, where could that have come from in evolution? The first important thing I want to get across tonight is this problem, because it's a problem that has been shelved all through this curious period of behaviorism that psychologists have been going through up to the last uh, 10 years when things began to change. And the problem is that evolution says that just with molecules and chance and various mechanisms of evolution, you get all the species that there are in the world. How out of that, how out of mere matter, can you get all this different quality of thing that goes on when we introspect? That is the problem. Now, after the theory of evolution, there were various kinds of solutions to that. There was something called uh, uh, neorealism at one time, in which they felt that indeed one can take uh, the interrelationships of matter and somehow that would turn into consciousness. Something has had a bit of revival when the people have tried to understand the paradoxes of quantum physics nowadays. I think a very muddled kind of solution. But then people like Charles Darwin felt that Consciousness began with the first one-celled animals and then had this marvelous evolution just as species did. And this didn't satisfy people. And so we had a whole group of people who said that the criterion for consciousness in evolution had to be learning. That was based on a fallacy too, with a fallacy of the association of ideas. And they felt learning with the association of ideas so that when an animal could learn, it had to have ideas and that was consciousness all very superficial kind of thinking. And so he said what consciousness is, and this is the part I like. It's, in short, creating a mind space. It's creating an analog of the real world in your mind. And he says it's like a giant metaphor. So you use your consciousness when you're trying to figure out something new. Like when you're hearing, and this is why, you know, when you're reading a book, and it's described like science fiction. If you read science fiction or fantasy, it's describing you as something weird, right? You've never seen before. So you kind of got to build a model in your brain in this thing called a mind space. And that that's kind of what consciousness is. Consciousness is the ability to think about thinking, right? And which is a, a kind of a crazy thing to think about. It's not natural. It's not natural to machines. It's not natural to animals. But the idea of I'm going to create a universe in my mind and within that universe, I'm going to figure things out. I'm going to draw pictures. I'm going to try and 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 solve a new problem. And to solve a new problem, you essentially have to use metaphors. A metaphor is like, this is like this. Like if I see a monster, I'm like, well, it's like a fucking bird mixed with a, a goose. Oh, and then bird is a goose. Bird mixed with a pig or something. And you're kind of like, okay, I'm approximating in this mind space I control using metaphors. That's how you do something new, right? So that he's like, that's what consciousness is. It's that mind space. Now... He doesn't mention this in the book, but I want to mention this because I. Well, first of all, what do you think about that? Does that make sense as a definition of consciousness? Do you think? I'm trying to to kind of grasp it, but yeah, I'm, I think so. Yeah, like I'm doing. I'm doing it in short, but uh, he starts by defining what consciousness is not. Like it's not a mechanical function. It's this extra thing. It's this ability to kind of work through reality in your mind. But the problem is. What I know is a lot of people don't have this ability. And he doesn't mention this in the book, like I said, but you'll notice and you see this in the news or this was like a meme, like ask someone to picture an apple in their mind. Um, some people straight up can't do it. Yeah. And this is why all speculation on my part, but I think this is why fiction isn't popular with a lot of people, because to enjoy fiction, you need to read what you're saying and kind of play it out in your head. Right. That's like an extra layer especially if you're if you're reading something unreal 
like fantasy or sci-fi. You need the ability to like approximate in your head to see this alien creature. Like I was reading Ring World not long ago, and you kind of need that uh, yeah. to 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 even read Ring World. But if you don't have that, it's just words on a page. Like, what is this? I don't get why people like this. That's what you would say. Yeah, or you yeah. ask them to picture an apple in your head, and it is a spectrum. Some people can picture an apple. Close your eyes. Do it right now if you want to. An apple with like really really fine detail you could spin it around in your head you can imagine it splitting in half um or if you've asked like i do this all the time when i and my wife is amazed that i can do it and it's like i that's why i'm good with directions because i could literally make a map in my head and say okay i started here i turned left i turned right and i'm modeling it in my head so i can find back where i went some i'm not some kind of genius but some people don't have that ability to put it simply my mind is blind my whole life, I have assumed that phrases like picture this and mind's eye were just metaphors. An attempt to explain the almost indescribable way our minds store and recall thoughts and memories. Because when I close my eyes, I don't see anything, ever. There's just a dark void, and images never flash before my eyes when they are open. If you think this sounds strange, I'm as shocked as you are. Not shocked that I exist, no. I'm completely flabbergasted that you do. On the other hand, if you're having an aha moment right now, then you may be learning that you have aphantasia the same way that I did mere months ago through the internet. And I, I said this uh, comment in the chat and maybe I'm going too far, but I would say that there's a high likelihood that a, a large percentage of the population, and I don't know the number, but let's say it's a fifth, a fifth of, and I'm being charitable. I think it's more than that, but let's say a fifth of people who by this definition are not conscious beings. Yes. And I think you could link this to IQ. I think the likelihood of people like this increase dramatically if you're sub 80 IQ. And that's a whole other thing entirely. I'm not going to even get into that. This book doesn't touch on that. We'll get to that next episode, in fact. But just to be aware that there's a lot of people who can't think like this and for all intents and purposes might be no better than just an automatic machine walking around. Um, you know, the idea was he was saying it's kind of like being you're driving in a car. And your consciousness is you like talking to people in the car while you're driving. You've done this before. Everyone's like, you know, driven somewhere and you're chatting, you're doing your music, you're not paying full attention, but you can still drive. That's yeah. your your body's kind of on automatic. That's what uh, life without consciousness is. You can still do stuff. You can still live in the world and follow rules and solve uh, probably solve the problems that are given to you. But you don't have that higher level to deconstruct things or think about why you're doing things or really, I would argue, plan far ahead in the future. So that's what consciousness is. Now, that's only the first little bit of the book, but you have to kind of introduce the idea of like an internal mind space where you play with metaphors. Um, he says the line he has is consciousness is to reality what mathematics is. It's an analog we use to uh, approximate the space with which we inhabit. Like mathematics is kind of our interpretation of the universe. And it's something we can use to make sense of it. It's an analog. It doesn't make it and less real, really, but it's just a thing that's unique to us that we need to utilize. Now, where he builds from this, and I like that. I, I might carry that with me in the future, just as, as a concept of how to define this. Um, now, the thesis he has is that there was a point in human history where humans did not have consciousness as we know it. And that this was, in fact, something that evolved over time, maybe in like the like year like 2000 BC, something like that. I'll, I'll give the exact date once I get to it in my notes. But at some point in the past, um, and he says there's some biological evidence of this. So he says if you look at the human brain, there's actually two speech centers in the human brain, one on the left side and one on the right side. And we, so we evolved to have one on the right side, but these days we don't use it anymore. And he says, so like, that's, that's relevant. Like, what's that about? We, we, we know that that part of the brain used to have a function. Now it doesn't have a function. What was the purpose of that part of the brain? Okay. So we start with that. But his whole thing is that at this point in human history, in the ancient world, there was no such thing as consciousness or awareness of thought. But we still have, you know, we had action, we had learning, we still, we were fucking just drone retards. We had all that, but we didn't have this thing called consciousness. And his thesis is that the consciousness at that point was just seen as the gods communicating to you. 
So you didn't have an internal monologue, but you still had the ability to kind of talk to yourself, but you didn't have the ability to stand outside of it. Right. So this idea, like an, an example would be schizophrenia. It is possible for a schizophrenic to know that they have schizophrenia and to argue with the voices in their head and say, I know you're not there. Yeah. An example would be back then, if you had schizophrenia, and there's no reason to believe that they didn't back then have it in some case, you would not have the ability to disobey the thoughts in your head. Right. You wouldn't have the ability to understand, to stand outside of yourself and break down abstract concepts. You're just hearing voices that would tell you what to do. Now, what percentage of those people uh, existed? We don't know. But he also makes a case that the amount of people in modern day society who hear audio hallucinations is around, I think he gave a number as high as 10%. Really? Yeah. People, and they know how to trigger this. They know how... There's some experiments he cited where they had, you know, modern living subjects and they activated that part of the brain and they were able to hear voices like your voice talking. And that's essentially what schizophrenia is. It's your mind talking to yourself in a very visceral and real way. You're literally hearing voices and they can describe the voices. And oftentimes, and this will get in the next part, oftentimes the voices were in the ones of their loved ones or someone who died. So to a certain amount of people who lack the ability to tell the difference, they would say, my ancestors are speaking to me right. from the grave or they are right. very, very present. And he gets, so he says around 10% of people experience audio hallucinations at, in various forms of various degrees. And they could trigger these things with, you know, experiments and drugs. And like, oh, I hear someone yelling from far away, you know, or you can hear it up close. It depends. It's a genetic thing. Um and so, yeah, he says the uh, speech center is on the left hemisphere of the brain, while other functions are on both hemispheres. He says the right side was previously for speech of the gods. And um, it's it's the entire thing is about language mediation. Experience in this area of the brain could trigger people hearing voices like schizophrenics. They're uh, usually what he found was like with schizophrenics and these voices people hear a common trend was they were always angry or admonishing. There's something about, and if you ask schizophrenics, if you ask people who have audio hallucinations, they'll say, yeah, they're always mad at me. <laughs> like they're always saying, don't do that. You fucking idiot. What's wrong with you? Or they're trying to trick you. A lot of people when they hear hallucinations, they're trying to trick them into doing something, which sounds a lot like what gods used to do. Yeah. Gods would tell you when you're fucking up, you're doing something wrong or they're, they're trickster gods. Right. And he gives an example. And again, this is speculation because we're talking about the ancient world. We're talking about where there's no written records. Um, but he says, you know, this might be a reason why um, if you look at they found these ancient burial sites going back thousands and thousands of years, they would routinely find in Europe, especially they would find them with bodies with their heads cut off or bodies were like the arms and legs were bound so he made the case that this they might have it makes no sense why they would do that um he said unless they thought that people were literally speaking to them from the grave yeah and i hear that i'm like huh okay like i i got something here and he says if you go back to the ancient inca world he said there's, there's a thing you notice where the a lot of these graves and statues and monuments are built to be extremely lifelike with very and when you want to make something extremely lifelike we talked about this when we talked about the book on killing the importance of the face. So it's actually, it's very easy to kill someone if you shoot them in the back of the head, or if you don't see their face, the face of the human face, even an animal face. When people talk about cute animals, they're looking at an animal face, which reminds them of a human baby face. It's the face is everything. So he said, there's a case to be made that the reason they made these statues so lifelike is because they thought they could communicate with the statues and when you want to make something lifelike you focus on the eyes and you give it an open mouth and he said there's records of Incan culture where they would actually speak with statues or they thought they could communicate with the gods through the statues which would and maybe it's not everyone maybe it's like 10% of the people and maybe those 10% become priests maybe those 10% are the ones who can speak with the gods Maybe yeah. that 10% become that naturally evolving cast, you know, or even a, a witch doctor or any and an elder, you know, things like that. Maybe that not saying that's what it is, 
but he's drawn some conclusions that I think like, hmm, that's that's interesting. And what he finds most interesting is that there is a break if you look at these ancient civilizations where we do have hieroglyphs. We do have what we do have are stone carvings and hieroglyphs that tell stories across hundreds and hundreds and thousands of years sometimes. And what he does notice is there is a break if we look at some of these hieroglyphs where uh, let me just actually cover a couple things first. Like what, what would their relationship with the God was before I get to that? So, you know, the purpose of the gods is how to provide guidance in new and novel situations, meaning that one hemisphere of the brain where you're trying to figure things out. That's essentially what we do with consciousness. Like how do we figure out what to do when we don't know what to do? We're not familiar with it. Well, you would listen to the gods and they would tell you what to do. Um, he gives an example in here, actually, of Osiris. Let me just read this for a second. Osiris, to go directly to the important part of this, was not a dying god, not life caught in the spell of death, or a dead god, as modern interpreters have said. He was the hallucinated voice of a dead king whose ad admonishments could still carry weight and since he could still be heard there is no paradox in the fact that the body from which the voice once came should be mummified with all of the equipment in the tomb providing the necessities food drinks slaves women and the lot there is no mysterious power that emanated from him simply he remembered simply his remembered voice which appeared in the hallucinations to those who had known him and which could admonish or suggest even as it had before he stopped moving and breathing and that various natural phenomena such as the whispering of waves could act as the cue for such hallucinations accounts for the beliefs that Osiris or the king whose body had ceased to move continues to control the flooding of the Nile further the relationship between Horus and Osiris embodies Bodied in each new king and his dead father forever can only be understood as the assimilation of a hallucinated advising voice into the king's own voice, which would then be repeated with the next generation. So that's him. That we're, we're talking about Egyptians. We're talking about you no know, stuff where there's there is evidence of it and how this evolves over time. He says, you know, to get to this point, you do need the creation of language. This isn't just a random thing that happens. So he says. You start with the creation of language, then you kind of get all this starting to happen because you can't have these voices without language unless you have words. So you need to have words and sentences and intent and things like that. Then the change that happens after that is the change in the conception of the self. Now, this isn't necessarily ideological. It could just be an evolution. You know, we evolve through time and we evolve our understanding of our place in the world. Once that happens, because he said back then people probably behaved way more collectively, the conception of the individual didn't really exist like that. And I think a lot of scholars would agree with that. Like our the concept of the sovereign individual, for example, is obviously a modern invention. But even back then, the concept of the individual as such might not have even existed. You were just you're kind of a being, but you're you were more of a collective. You probably defaulted to the tribe and the collective way, way more than you would now. But as we change the conception of self, we start to see the breakdown of the bicameral mind. The bicameral mind just means the balance of everything. Everything in your mind is perfectly balanced. There is no division between all these different, uh, between the God and reality. You're, the gods were as real as your own mind was real. Your own mind was as real as everyone else's mind, which was as real as like society. Everything was kind of balanced back then. And only in modern times do we have these sharp delineations between myself and then the group and then the group and the world and different types of groups. So back then everything was probably a bit more peaceful and people like objected to stuff less. But then once we do, we see the breakdown of the bicameral mind. And interestingly enough, what he says, there's evidence of this. Um, and the emergence of consciousness was due to us distancing from the gods through trade, other cultures, mingling with people. So he says, you know, as we start to see other groups, th this thing starts to change and maybe de-evolve. And he says, this is near the second millennium. So the time frame he's giving is the second millennium is when this started because we can track the progress of, of uh, language and also trade routes and things like that. And uh, and as an outgrowth of language, as language changes, so this uh, change. And he said an example of the breakdown was in Mesopotamia. 
And he says the the right brain begin the right hemisphere where this is begins to break down as evidenced in the art. And you start to see in Mesopotamia around this second millennium, you, more people are making more art about being abandoned by the gods. And I saw them like, huh, that's interesting. Like something happened where people can't hear the gods anymore. And this takes place over the course of like a thousand years, right? But it's like you start to see more and more art, more and more writing, more and more statues about being abandoned by the gods. We can't hear their voices anymore. So how do we do that? We need to have more and more rituals and things like that. But um, you also start to see an increase in people who can reestablish communication with the other side whereas more and more people had it before this is where you get divination this is where you get the witch doctors this is where you get the people who are very very specially selected to in his words have an umbilical cord with the unknown so he says as we start to progress there's fewer and fewer people who can do this but we still have individuals who are trying to who are trying to speak with the other world and this is modern day psychics it's this belief that there's something out there we can't communicate with and we used to be able to and we can't did we do something what caused the gods to abandon us we got to figure it out we have to reestablish communication and so every culture has different ways to do that and this ties into i think uh the book the ancient city which we covered a very very popular book about blood worship it is possible Again, maybe this isn't real, but it is possible that the people who had a direct one-to-one -one relationship with their ancestors through blood, uh, blood religion, blood, you know, uh, ancestral worship is what we call it, because their bodies were buried on their their property. You know, you had family tombs, and you had a, a more direct, you know, causal relationship with, you know, meeting with them and having rituals for them. It could be stated that you know that was a much more literal relationship than we originally thought you hear that that's interesting that some things start falling into place when you hear this like why did we do this and then we stopped that's kind of what he's asking here like why did we stop doing this stuff and why does all this art talk about the gods not talking to us anymore and we build our society with trying to reestablish them and then there was a point where the there was no line of division between a king and a god right when we talked about that book um i think it was thomas Carlisle. It was uh, on heroes and the state of heroism. You know, we look in the past that there we talk about Odin. Odin was a guy. The story of Odin was the guy who, who invented runes to the Norse people. There was no difference between a god and a great man. And the idea was that this was an individual who had a relationship with the unknown, who went into the unknown and came back with knowledge. That's the one fundamental thing that connects all of these individuals across time but we notice as we go back in time there's a blurred line between gods and man and great men and, and all this stuff because he's james is proposing we lived in a world where everything was blurred and that's a completely different way of interacting with the world and experiencing it and my uh, stance is i don't think we can ever reclaim it i think we literally biologically evolved out of that and that's why it might be dangerous to either glorify that or say, you know, we can reclaim that. We can do that again. Like, I don't think we have the parts for that anymore, unfortunately. Anyway, so so far, what do you think of that from what I'm saying so far? What do you think? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's uh, it explains a lot. You know, it's a it's a big if true type thing. Um, and it, it it's it's something that I think we don't we're so modern now and we don't really think about it. But yeah, it's consistent. Yeah. And I'll, I'll just read a part here. It says, um, the evidence is, I feel, fairly substantial. The absence of gods in bas reliefs and cylinder seals, the cries about lost gods that wail out of the silent cuneiforms, the emphasis on prayer, the introduction of new kinds of silent divinities, angels and demons, the new idea of heaven, all strongly indicate that, a hallucinate, that the hallucinated voices called gods are no longer guiding the companions of men. What then takes over their function? How is action initiated? If hallucinated voices are no longer adequate to the escalating complexities of behavior... How can decisions be made? Subjective consciousness, that is, the development, the basis of linguistic metaphors of an operation of space in which an I could narratorize out alternative actions and their consequences. So he's literally saying that, you know, the idea of the I in the mind space evolved out of necessity 
of us. So the, the, the sequence of events would be the breakdown of that part of our mind due to us being exposed to new different types of people and cultures and new ideas. And they're just breaking down naturally. Then we evolve this thing called a consciousness, this concept of the I, the me as an individual in this space and crafting this mind space where I can have control over it. And so that he's claiming that this all evolved out of that. Now we could say what caused the evolution. Maybe we bicker about that. Maybe there's other things. How much of it is biological, how much of it is environmental, whatever, you know, but the, the core thesis there, I thought was very, very fascinating and maybe think about things because at the end of the day, like I said, he is referencing sources that are real that they, they will remark about a break in the tradition where they were portraying gods one way and then they portrayed them a different way. What caused that? We don't have an answer really. I think this could be an answer to that, you know, and it allows us to also spatialize time and track history. See, and this is what we were talking about with people with like really low IQs can't really understand time. He said the ability to us for us to, kind of describe history didn't really exist before 1300 bc he said we see this in uh the hieroglyphs in, in egypt especially where it's like you know a new king arrives he's just kind of the same king but then we start seeing hieroglyphics of this king portraying himself as part of a line of kings you know one king talking about a previous king was kind of a new idea you know, the ability to look back in time and talk about it as if it's a space you could explore. Yeah. There was a time when that was new, which meant that you can kind of predict in the future. Again, a new thing. Otherwise, it was kind of just the present in a sense, <laughs> you know, because just like if you lacked consciousness, you look around like things happen and I can learn. I can learn what to do, what not to do. I can have go here to do this, but you don't have the ability to imagine a future and you are a character in that future. That didn't exist. So, and we, he claims that happened around 1300. He also points to the shifts in the, the Greek language over time, like the shift from psyche, from life into soul, because he says in ancient Greek writings, probably the best evidence we have, he makes a claim that, you know, in the Iliad, the earliest forms of writing we have, there's no discussion of consciousness. I would say, yeah, yeah, but that's not, maybe that's not the story where that would be a big part of it, right? But he also says that if you look at Greek uh, literature and Greek writing, there is a shift in this thing called the psyche from this thing that you are your psyche and then this idea of a soul which emerges in writing over time, this new idea of a thing called the soul, which is kind of a part of you, but not really. And it's like the, 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 as the spatialization of entire concepts separating from literal gods. And maybe this is where you get Plato's forms from, the idea of Plato thinking, okay, is there a space behind the space, right? To think like that, you need to have a much more advanced spatialization of existence, which you might not even have without consciousness. That's the claim he's making. And I'm like, okay. Another claim he makes, and I don't know enough about this to say whether it's true or false, but he says, look at the difference between the New Testament and the Old Testament, right? So he's saying like, you know, the, the difference in language, the different conception of the soul, the different types of people and what they did. He says the, the split between the New Testament and the Old Testament is kind of evidence of a psychological and biological shift in how we conceptualize the soul and, and in fact how we conceptualize god now i don't know i'm not a, a theologian i can't speak to that but he makes that claim in the book which i think is is kind of interesting anyway that's that's pretty much all i had to say on that topic it's a big topic but uh do you have any additional thoughts on that i, I kind of went all over the place there because it's a it's a big idea and i don't want to go through all the sources i'd recommend people read it it's a pretty big that's book it's over 400 pages, but there's a lot of you know backing up he does in this too. It's kind of a different perspective, like looking at, like I always kind of think of it like, oh, you're, you know, you have consciousness and that's just part of being humanity and it's always been that way. And when you have, like, if you had visions or if you had auditory hallucinations or any just like environmental interference with your mode of thinking, even thinking about like SSRIs or stuff or, or psychedelics that alter the way that you think, that always seems like something external and secondary that's fucking with you. But like may maybe 
maybe that's actually the foundational part of 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 your brain maybe that's mostly what we were for history and what other living beings are and consciousness is something recent and unique and maybe not even all people have it and it's just a special evolved layer on top of that and if you, yeah if you look at it that way it explains a lot it really does explain a lot so yeah food for yeah that, for and sure. also yeah food for that. and some people and i go back to the earlier point that there might be an i don't know how many people it would be or what percentage it would be but an amount of people in our society who in effect don't have consciousness and don't have that ability you know we can relate to iq like if you're if you have a below 80 iq i think there's studies that show like you your concept of spatializing time you can't really tell the difference between the past and the future and you you find it difficult to create hypotheticals yeah that's what they say like if they yeah. go and they did with this with criminals they did this with like sub 80 people like I, the example we gave earlier in the episode you know some of these really really sub 80 i believe 80 is the number where just the example i gave which is you know you ate breakfast this morning what would happen if you didn't eat breakfast like but i did eat breakfast like they can't imagine themselves yeah yeah yeah, yeah. outside of themselves like that so, and that i think has uh implications for democracy implications yep. for any as we uh move to a more highly advanced society and there's fewer and fewer things they can do just on automatic uh i think that's going to be a big problem going forward and we should just be aware of it maybe do not let the rapists win listen and love blood satellite